Hello, and welcome to the Future Christian Podcast, your source for insights and ideas into what it means to live as a follower of Jesus in the 21st century. At the Future Christian Podcast, we talk to pastors, authors, and other faith leaders for helpful advice and practical wisdom to help you and your community of faith walk boldly into the future. Here's your host, Lauren Richmond Jr. Hey, and thanks for listening in to the Future Christian Podcast. And my name is Lauren Richmond Jr., and I'm pleased to be joined by Reverend Karen Rohr. Hello. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Yeah, thanks for being here. Uh, Karen was super gracious and because uh, I totally screwed up the time of this interview, and uh, she was able to make it work. So thank you. Thank you for that. It's, it's great. I'm so glad it would work. <laughs> well, uh, Karen is the director of the Church Planning Initiative at Pittsburgh Theological Seminary and a PCUSA pastor. She was the founding co-pastor of Beacon Church in Philadelphia, where she became dog parent to the winsome Pitbull Melody and the wife of Reverend Andy Greenhow. She's a Presbyterian pastor and life-sized cartoon. Wait, you're the cartoon? No, my husband's the cartoon. Oh, the dog. Oh, okay. Reverend Andy Green. <laughs> I told you, uh, I struggle with words. I struggle with words sometimes. It's bad for a preacher. Um, her first edited book has recently come out, Sustaining Grace, Innovative Ecosystems for New Faith Communities from, you say the publisher, I can't say that. Whippenstock. I know, it's with there a P go. and an F together, Whippenstock. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm a little uh, slap happy today because fatigue and stress and all that. Pandemic um, life. Well, uh, pandemic life. Yes. Uh, tell us. Tell us about yourself. What else would you like our listeners to know about you? Let's see. Um, so I came from Philadelphia to Pittsburgh at the end of 2016, and my time in Philadelphia was as a planting pastor. So I think of myself as a practitioner kind of um, at sea in the land of academia, which is a ton of fun, actually. Um, I'm around people who are deeply trained and brilliant all the time. Um, and mm -hmm. I get to do a lot of hands-on stuff in the midst of a kind of theoretical space, which suits me well. Um, so that's kind of my story. Yeah. I live with my husband, Andy, and my sweet pit bull, Melody. Awesome. My dog is trying to, one of my dogs is trying to cuddle up with me right now so <laughs> <laughs> they're insistent yeah yeah um tell us kind of tell us about your faith journey what it what what looked like your faith looked like for you growing up and and if anything's changed or looks different now sure um so i sort of started to claim my own faith in young life so i was raised in the church we went to a presbyterian church growing up um and they were my family, but I didn't really think of the faith as my own rather than something that the community kind of held in trust for me um, until mm -hmm. my experience in Young Life. And that was largely positive. I have ambivalent feelings about Young Life now. It's a big tent. And Yeah, um, I was just going to ask you that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I was a leader in college a bit, but I... Mm -hmm. It took me a long time to realize that there were some like gender dynamics that I had not faced before and so didn't understand. I spent a lot of time being yeah. like, no, no one wants to hear what I have to say. Am I uninteresting? <laughs> yeah. And then it hit me like a ton That's of bricks. That's hard. But the real issue, I think, with Young Life for me was a theological one, which is at the end of the day, we were asking, we were attempting to tally and measure uh, the commitments people made and the changes that they made in favor of Jesus Christ. And yeah, ultimately yeah. that didn't agree with what felt like the day-to-day -day work of young life to me, which was, um, what Sam Wells talks about as being with, right? Like the gift of mm -hmm. young life for me was you're building a community and being with people because God loves them. You're investing in their lives. You're caring about who they are and who they're becoming, um, simply because they're beloved of God. And, and ultimately it didn't make sense that I was then sort of tallying up and counting and asking, you know, did you make a decision for Jesus Christ? It, it stopped seeming so binary for me. Um, 
and it, and so it stopped making sense as a method of ministry. Karen, I'm we'll wait on this to get into this, but I'm already seeing a connection because uh, your work as a church planning initiative, like the the contradiction or the paradox between what you measure and what your mission. Like, let's, I'll wait to get into that, but you're, you're recognizing that early on and that is so relevant to church planning, but keep going. Yeah. I mean, that's absolutely right. And that was, um, that has been an ongoing theme in my life, uh, because I love, I love the meshing of form and content. And if we're trying mm -hmm. to do something particular, I want us to be finding a way to measure and, uh, assess that thing. And it makes me absolutely crazy when we're saying we value one thing and measuring something else. Um, so yeah. in that way, the, the tenure at Young Life, um, it, it eventually became frustrating for that reason, for reasons of gender. Um, there was also a, a, like a lot of pressure to, um, you know, at the time reject LGBTQ people. At the time mm -hmm. I was like working through that issue, trying to understand what was going on and that felt wrong, but I didn't have mm -hmm. any theological I didn't feel theological freedom to say that feels wrong. And so I'm rejecting the pressure you're putting on me to tell kids they can't yeah. do some, some particular way. Yeah. Um, and then seminary kind of gave me the language and the freedom to be like, ah, no, there's biblical precedent for this. Um, yeah. Anyway, we're getting more into young life than we need to, but <laughs> yeah. Did you grow up in the Presbyterian church or uh, did you kind of come to it? I grew up in the peace USA um, but because my faith was really formed in the Young Life space, I I didn't have occasion to mm -hmm. think about the particularities of the Presbyterian Church until college, really. Okay. Now, what was the push that kind of was like, hey, I want to go to seminary? <laughs> well, I was a world religion major. Um, I loved the study of religion. I was interested in the theory. I had great professors, uh, one of whom was an Episcopal priest, one of whom was um, the atheist son of a Lutheran pastor, um, who, oh, wow. you know, knew, <laughs> he knew more about Greek and ancient languages yeah. and yep. like a brilliant guy. Um, and so I, I was really fascinated by the study and I had this experience in young life that led me to believe that like the Christian story had something unique to offer. And I wanted to do something mm. with my life in fidelity to the Christian story and uh, for building community and like human thriving. Um, I didn't think I was gonna be a pastor when I left for seminary, which seems insane. Like what what did I think I was gonna do? I don't know. Um, but pretty soon after I got there, I was like, oh, this is the thing. I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be a pastor. Yeah. I, I was writing down that statement you said, uh, the Christian story has something unique to offer because I wanna come back to that. <laughs> Uh, yeah, for sure. What spiritual practice or um, have you developed that's been meaningful to you or might you recommend to others? Sure. Um, the two big ones that I'm thinking about a lot in this season of my life, because things are so lonely, um, yeah. there's there are personal practices like that I do by myself. And that has been in flux for a long time because I grew up with a sort of evangelical daily quiet time kind of model. Um, which has shifted for me significantly. Um, but really during quarantine, communal spiritual practices have been really valuable. So I see a spiritual director uh, who's changed my life. She's extraordinary, uh, very, very helpful. I also do group spiritual direction, uh, which has been mm -hmm. a gift. That's a new practice. And then in my marriage, but also in the classes that we teach at the seminary, we do some variation of examine really regularly. So in my marriage, we do it daily. Um, with my students, we do it every time we gather for class or for our lunches. Um, and the variation that we do is just answering the question, where have you felt closest to God's call in your life? And where have you felt furthest away since we last, talk last talked? Um, so that would be examine, is that question? Or a form yeah. question similar to that? Yeah, similar to that. I mean, the exam, it takes all kinds of forms, right? But it's really looking for God in the consolations and desolations of your everyday life. Um, hmm. And that's been really, that's been really a gift, particularly in the midst of pandemic. Yeah, I, I bet. Well, let's talk about um, your work as the 
You're the director, right? Is that the right title? That is the right title, director of the Church Planting Initiative. Yeah, and uh, I will say uh, of the other, or there's a few PTSs. Uh, I am a graduate of Phillips Theological Seminary, uh, we're PTS Tulsa, and I know, I, I'm aware that there's another famous PTS seminary, right? Uh, that's true. So um, I am a graduate of Princeton Theological Seminary, and I work at Pittsburgh Theological Seminary. So, <laughs> so we've got a trifecta here on this podcast. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah, of the PTSs. Well, talk about the impetus and mission of the church planning initiative there. Uh, yeah, so sort of the 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 told story that I inherited when I got here, which is one that I really appreciate, is that graduates of Pittsburgh Theological Seminary about 15 years ago started planning churches. And there was no program at Pittsburgh Theological Seminary to train people to do that. They just started doing it. And the seminary looked around and said like, okay, if our graduates are going to be doing this, then they need particular training and support to do it. Um, we need to be responsive to kind of what God is doing in this space, which is really powerful. Um, and so the church planting initiative formed actually a couple of years before they hired anyone to lead it. But my predecessor, who, who is um, a halftime director and a, a brilliant guy, like deeply faithful, his name is Chris Brown, and he's a pastor in Colorado now, um, he came in in 2014. Oh yeah, you should definitely, he's in Berthoud? Berthoud, Ber yeah. Berthoud. Yeah, there it is. You know how to say it. <laughs> Chris um, Brown. That's too bad. I just did a local, uh, local season, but listeners check it out. Season three, <laughs> but I'm sorry. Keep going. <laughs> yeah. He's, he's a wonderful guy. So he was my predecessor. He started in 2014, um, and sort of made a path for the church planting initiative which he he started the part of the program which cares for and shepherds MDiv students in specialized church planting training. Um, and so that happens within the MDiv curriculum. Students can sign up to specialize in that way. And then when I came on board at the end of 2016, we launched pretty immediately a certificate program. And the okay. certificate is for people who are in a context. So revitalization okay. or planting, you're doing your thing, and you think I could I could use a cohort to walk through this with, I could use some intentional time and space in my life to tackle a big issue. And we're not talking like, um, I need to raise money, I know how to raise money, um, I just need help doing it. We're talking like, this is a big question I have about this work and I don't know how to answer it. Um, so more yeah. adaptive change, imagination expansion kind of stuff. Um, so it's a 15 month program. It's hybrid. People come for four days at a time and then come back to their own context, do the work in their context, report out about that work online, um, work with a coach for the full 15 months. And so it's four classes um, and then one final project presentation coaching all the way through with a with a small cohort. Okay. Cool. What would you say? What would you say are like the biggest aims? Like when I think I'll throw out some words here, like to empower people, to incubate, to educate, like what, what kind of, would you say most, uh, links there? Yeah. Um, I like the word empower for sure. Um, mm -hmm. we're, we're interested in, um, equipping leaders to convene and build collaborative cultures. Um, That's so, another good you know, E word. Yeah. Sorry, I'm interrupting. No, no, you're you're totally fine. Totally fine. <laughs> we have a little um, lag here too, so it's slow. Internet life. Internet life. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, I mean, we we have seen that people outside the church have spiritual experiences. They see that the Holy mm -hmm. Spirit is active, and in a lot of cases. Um, have their own language to name it, um, and would resonate with the Christian story were the Christian story something they were invited into, but most of them have not been invited into it. Right. Um, and so yeah. we're, our goal is to train leaders, uh, to have the imagination that would allow them to see the Holy spirit active in the world. So I use the word imagination, but I don't mean Disney. I mean, um, yeah, yeah. 
you have to imagine something is possible before you have eyes to see it. And yep. we are trying I mean, that to kind cultivate... of resonates with Disney, right? Because the story is that he imagined Walt Disney World, right? Yeah. I mean, to be fair, you know, I, I give Disney yeah. a hard time. Um, you know, Bambi as a child was tough and I'm still reeling from the wound. <laughs> um, but no, that, that's like, this is part of, part of what I see as the creative work of the Christian is to um, imagine that God might be up to something um, and mm -hmm. that it might be surprising. And it's hard to imagine things that are surprising. So we yeah. want to support and walk with leaders as they broaden imaginations for what God might be up to and invite people to participate in it with them. So broaden their imaginations yeah. and help them facilitate that broadening for others. Yeah. Um, I have to ask, this is more of a generic question, but as I've gotten into church planning and study it more, like there are wildly different understandings of what it means to plant a church everywhere from like, you know, somebody like a church split, half the people go elsewhere and the pastor will be like, Hey, I started a church. Uh, you know, <laughs> A mega church will like take 200 people and go start a new campus, and you know their pastor is a church planter. Um, a church will like close, sell their building, and then go start a new church, and that's a church plant. So, and, and there's there's more models. Like that's maybe half, or you know, there's so many more different understandings. Of, so it's a broad understanding. Like, do do you have like a specific model you work with? Uh, you know. To help me out there, I guess. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we think about this contextually, and so there are sort of an infinite number of models as there are an infinite number of uh, types of communities or neighborhoods or cultures, mm -hmm. um, sort of the microculture of a neighborhood. Uh, there, are, So there are all kinds of different models depending on what is needed. I think what yeah. I would say is is not our model is to come into a place that's unknown to you and bring your own style, power of personality, aesthetic, yeah. um, your own personal gospel and set up shop in somebody else's backyard. Um, See, and, I'm and, here in Colorado yeah. and that's like, that's the, that's the model for church planning. Uh, I have a guy I work with who regularly interacts with these kind of church planners that, that it's like the parachute model will parachute in often with like a whole team folks who come from a church often in the south and they like you know it'll be like five six seven families and they'll come in and they'll they'll go for it i mean it's 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 impressive i guess in some ways but yeah um i imagine you might yeah it's um this is complicated you know i was talking to someone about this this morning because i don't think it is a good idea for a leader to go in alone right um mm -hmm. oh yeah 100 percent but the models that we have for training clergy uh, sort of take someone out of a context, scrub the context off of them, give them sort of a, You're not wrong. a presumption yeah. of <laughs> universal f truths and ideas and send them back into the world totally deplaced. Um, yeah. That's a problem, I think. But also it's a problem to say, like, uh, I'm going to go in alone. It, bringing in an army of people is a problem because that's not, then it's not about the place. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, although there's something that you have to respect about people who will get up and move their lives and do a thing because it's what they feel called to do. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, so often that's happening though in neighborhoods that, um, that have just been re renamed by realtors so that they can sell the house yeah. for more money. Um, and like, yeah, we have to have a conversation about church planting and gentrification. Um, that's not, mm -hmm. it is not respectable, respectful to go into a community that likely has churches that have struggled to make it for generations and be like, oh, don't worry. All the people who attend those churches will soon be priced out. So we'll bring in everybody who looks like us and have a, a real nice place here. Um, that's mm -hmm. not a gospel yeah. thing. Um, years ago, Christina Cleveland wrote a, a brilliant um blog about this and it was like church planting it, it compared church planting to plantations it's very damning um and rightly so oh wow um but this is something that we have to think about in terms of responsibly yeah. doing this work um and so while it's complicated to go a leader to go in alone 
I sort of feel like part of the work is to go into a space and listen um, and and be hosted by everything that that space is and has to offer before you go mm -hmm. in um, to tell them what's what. It, tell me if this, uh, if you study this or uh, I'm assuming you're familiar with the term of community-based or asset-based development, right? That's sure. kind of what I hear you saying. Is that fair? Yeah. You know, I'm, we, we teach asset-based community development. We use um, Peter Block and John McKnight's work. Um, okay. And they are, I mean, I'm a big Peter Block fan. Peter Block has been a part of my thinking and life since I lived in Philadelphia. Um, and he's like a jovial guy. Usually public figures are not as uh, endearing. <laughs> um, so I love what he does. I sometimes wonder if it takes into account. So the, the idea for folks who don't know asset-based community development, the basic idea is that the community has everything that it needs uh, yeah, to Yeah, thanks heal. for defining them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, to, to heal and, and to be whole and to, to thrive. So the abundant yeah. community is a community that is in touch with its own gifts and power uh, through networks and associations built by the people in the community. I think this is lovely. I definitely like I'm a I'm a fan of the premise. I buy the premise, um, except that I also think we have to have a conversation about communities that have been systemically robbed in the U.S. Mm -hmm. like sure. over generations, um, because it's it's a hell of a thing to say like. Yes, the community has absolutely everything that it needs to thrive, uh, despite the fact that we've decimated the community every chance we've gotten yeah. for, you know, six, since 1619 and in terms of Native peoples before even that. Yeah. Um, so, and, and I think Peter Block is getting to this, you know, some of his later life work is conversations about reparations and jubilee, um, which I really appreciate because I think that that needs to happen too. Yeah. So there's contradictions in this work. But yeah, I'm a big fan of asset-based community development. Yeah, and I, I'm also going back to, and I told you I was going to come back to this, <laughs> what you said about the Christian story having something unique to offer. Um, correct me if you disagree, but I think that's the challenge is that a pastor or a planter might, is going and saying, hey, I do have something unique to offer. Is that is that fair? Um, so, yes. But I think, um, so another another uh, thinker that we sort of, one, one of the things that my colleague Scott is very good at teaching and what I really appreciate about this is that he mm -hmm. talks about uh, the, the missionary movement and the many sins of the missionary movement, but also yeah. the things that we can learn from it. Um, mm -hmm. And he looks at Jehu Hensels for this, um, who, who talks about basically how uh, the first wave of missionaries who came to other parts of the world out of the West um, were not the ones who were successful at making helping the gospel to catch on in local places. It was actually the okay. early adopters who did the work, and they made the faith local. Um, hmm. And so the, the work that they were doing was translating, sure— um, but they were translating it with their whole lives. They were absorbing the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ and um, learning how to live it deeply as themselves within their culture, mm -hmm. within their story. And so I think if we're bringing the, if, if we are um, purporting to, to talk some, to speak about something that is unique in the gospel of Jesus Christ, we need to learn how to hear how it is already happening in the cultures that are hosting us and be hmm. able to name it. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Because I don't, I don't actually carry the gospel in my person. Um, I I'm desperately in need of the gospel. So when I'm doing church work, I'm, I am going out and looking for it in my own way and hoping to encounter wow. it. I mean, in church planting was such a huge lesson in this holiness just showed up and sort of landed in my lap because I came and said, I want to have these conversations. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. This is great stuff. Um, I love how you're, I appreciate really how you're going about this from the, such a theological lens. Um, this next question is not theological at all, but I, <laughs> I'm curious to hear your perspective. <laughs> like, sure. um, in so many of like the evangelical church planning movements, there's 
there's personality tests and all that stuff. Like, is there in your mind, like an ideal church planter, an ideal person? Like, what does that mean? Anything is that should we throw it out the window? Oh, man, I, I want to. I mean, so you have to understand that I, I come at this from being a, like, I was a very young planter when I started this work. Mm-hmm. I was, what, 25, 26. Um, I was a suburban raised, college educated white lady. Um, mm-hmm. I was in a very particular role, one with a ton of privilege and one that also um, the church historically and still now sometimes looks down on being a young woman, right? Mm -hmm. So both of those things. Um, And I learned very quickly that I was not called to be the pastor in many situations, if for no other reason than the people could not be led by me Um, because of, you know, the body I was in, the story that I carried. Um, Mm -hmm. And and that has to be right. Like there are communities that can't be led by a middle class white lady. Um, Sure. Yeah. That's important. That's good. Yeah. Um, But it my particularity uh, was effective for the people that I served in Philadelphia for a variety of reasons. You know, even my weaknesses um, ended up being a gift because I needed people to help me. And it made this space much more collaborative than I thought it would be. So yeah, um, there are definitely, I mean, I say that, I think particularity matters. I think leading as you are called to lead and not trying to put on somebody else matters. Yeah, um, yeah. I want to set leaders free to do that. Often people who are introverts think like, I could never plant a church. Like right, actually, right. if you love a people enough, you will find yourself doing insane things. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of conflict diverse and I, there was a moment in our, in our little church where there was like serious tension. Somebody sort of broke the space, uh, broke the worship, the set, the sacred nature of the worship space uh, to mm-hmm. say something mean during worship. Mm. Um, and that's the kind of thing that if somebody said, Hey, you're gonna have to deal with this in seminary, I was like, Oh no, like maybe yeah. I shouldn't be a pastor. And, but in the <laughs> moment it was like, Oh no, yeah. you don't get to say that. <laughs> this church. Oh, yeah. We're going to have a conversation about what just happened in the middle of worship. Um, good for you. There's, you know, <laughs> well, I mean, I don't know. It's in the moment it was instinctive because yeah. you know, I, I felt the weight of how much I love those people. Mm. Um, uh, but I feel like I'm getting far afield of your original question. No, I, I mean, I think, that- I think you're answering it well. Um, I, I, Cause I've thought about this, uh, you know, I'm a straight white cisgendered man. And I thought about the limitations in which that I can minister to the people that I'm trying to minister to. Uh, so I think, I think you're, yeah, I really hear what you're saying. Yeah. I mean, to be honest, though, I think there are also people who can only hear someone who presents as you present as a leader. Mm. And like, yeah, sometimes I wish that wasn't so like I wish everyone could handle having a lady pastor, but that doesn't work for some people. And if I'm honest, if it doesn't work for them, it's not going to work for me. I don't want it. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Um, That comes from a place of privilege. You know, I'm, I'm a pastor who's lucky to be employed. So there's that. And we have to acknowledge that tension. Um, yeah. And I do think there are certain, um, not necessarily giftings, but maybe character traits uh, that are vital for this work or even regular postures or practices. Um, mm-hmm. So I work with the 1001 New Worshiping Communities Movement, and they have a leadership assessment. And it's not like, are you super charming and good in front of a room? Do you wear tight jeans and play the guitar? Yeah. <laughs> Can you lead worship? Do you have really sculpted hair? Um, but it is like hair helps, about... hair helps. <laughs> Gosh, oh, how have we got I'm here? I'm sorry. That, that's Jesus my weakness. Christ. Karen is, uh, that's my weakness, uh, for our viewers. We'll go look the website. Hair is not my strong suit. Oh, I'm sorry, boy. Karen. Keep going. <laughs> no, it's totally fine. Um, yeah. So, but there are, there are postures, you know, there are things like how willing are you to take a risk and, Mm, um, yeah. How how are you at staying with something that's difficult? What does it look oh, like? Oh my goodness! When you yeah. 
interact with, you know, across cultures. Yeah, it's, staying with something difficult is big, right? This work is really hard. You know that. Karen, my number one thing that I would say of learning is like the ability to get out of bed on a Monday morning. <laughs> yeah. Be like, because... I'm sure you've experienced it. I'm sure you, the people you've worked with experienced it when you work your, you know, you work your ass off, if I can be frank. And Sunday morning comes and like, you know, nobody shows up. You know, I, I remember one Sunday, like literally no one was in. It, we were meeting in a gym, in a school gym, and literally nobody was in the seats. And I just had to start. I just had to start, you know, start talking <laughs> as if somebody was there. <laughs> Now, thankfully, somebody showed up, but people showed up. But man, that was awful. And it, and there's those days where it's just, man, and getting out of bed on Sunday Monday morning is just that's uh, I'd say that's the number one for me. I would say, right. And and it, learning how to balance the lesson that we must learn when something doesn't work or doesn't work how we think it should work, with the calling on our lives and the faith that we have that what we're doing is important and oh, how so to good. discern that is like, yeah. Oh man, it, it can, it can suck you under in a big way in terms of getting out of bed on Monday morning for sure. Yeah. Let me, let me tell you, Karen, I'll be real here and say like, it is hard for me and my dogs are playing here. So <laughs> it is hard for me. Not, I have to actively fight to not correlate metrics church metrics with my legitimacy of my call. Like, cause that's just the nature of this beast of church planning in many ways. Well, and we've been trained to do that. Um, yeah. it's, it is deep in us because it, it is deep in the, the parent churches that formed us. Right. Yeah. Um, Protestantism in the U S is having an identity crisis around why no one loves us anymore. And there are a lot of really <laughs> obvious reasons, Yeah, um, but, but leaders, you know, go to bed Sunday night thinking if only I was, um, yeah. because we're yeah. not able to have the, the broader system wide conversations that say like, there are some things going on here that aren't healthy. And in the absence of those conversations, everybody's going to bed thinking, Oh, it's me. It's me. Okay. Let's, this is the question I want to ask you. So let's hit it. Cause you're hitting at it, the systemic challenges and you and I were both uh, part of mainline Protestant de denominations. Can you speak to some of those bigger systemic issues or at least as you see them? Yeah. I mean, um, I don't want to get you fired here. So <laughs> no, no, no. You can I talk mean, generically. The great gift of being at, um, at a seminary is that like my, my employment encourages me to speak freely about the truths that I see mm. because we're the, yeah. you know, it's, it's not the same as uh, being in parish ministry as it was. Um, and to yeah. be fair, I, I mean, we got a ton of funding from the denomination. We were, we were well supported. We got a lot of gifts there. Um, I think the problem is bigger than that. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, Willie James Jennings, but he's uh, brilliant. He writes a lot about race and faith. Um, Okay. And he also is a scholar of Acts. And so he wrote this Acts commentary. And listeners of this podcast, if you get nothing from me except go by Willie James Jennings' Acts commentary, it was worth your time. Um, it's I'll check it's it absolutely out. absolutely brilliant. It's so good. Um, yeah, and I'd love to talk to you about it after you read it. Um, but he says, um, the logic of empire is self-replication. Mm, and yeah. I wish I could say that our mainline denominations were not empire, but they are. And what the push is in church planting is self-replication. And it's muscle memory. It's not just in the people outside of me. It's in me too. And I have to pay yeah. attention to that. Yeah. Because what, what, what I'm told that I should be trying to create is the churches that came before and yeah. I, what I'm trying to do, I hope, is respond to what the Holy Spirit is doing in the midst of God's people now. And that's coming, you know, God's God's future comes from the future. God's hope for us, God's reconciliation for us comes from the future. It's not based on the slow march of history 
Mm-hmm. Um, it's not based on all of the horrible things that human beings have done up until now. Uh, God comes to us from the future. And so I don't, yeah. I don't want to self-replicate. I don't want to live under the logic of empire. And I think that is the big tension that we face in church planting. Yeah. Well, it's so good. Let's talk about that future then. Like, what do you see? Uh, we're, we're in a time of disruption and COVID. Um, how do you see this shaping the future of, of church planning, church in general? I mean, I'll give you some uh, broadly to answer that. Yeah, I'm, I've been thinking about this a lot. I don't, I'm, I'm trying to get on board with virtual stuff, but the, I'm not mm-hmm. thinking in the direction of virtual church for this. I'm thinking about, okay. um, I'm seeing a bunch of neighborhood groups. I'm seeing small business um, collaboratives in Pittsburgh doing this. I'm seeing yeah. um, like community organizers and leaders arranging this kind of thing themselves. Mutual aid societies. Um, oh. Our social safety net has fallen apart. If we, I mean, yeah. there are some people who never had one, right, in the U.S., and we've right, pretended that right. that isn't so. Um, but the the social safety net has fallen apart. You know, there's an effort to take away health care um, in the middle of a pandemic. There's all this yeah. stuff, people losing jobs. And I think there's actually a, a moment for the church to consider what it means to be pretty radically interdependent, uh, to build hmm. communities that are pretty radically interdependent, Um and and to to live uh, the sort of abundant community that asset based community development talks about in a more mm-hmm. real way. Now that we know what it's like to not have functional leadership in the midst of a crisis, hmm. um, I think there's a real opening there. I also think that there's an openness to start having conversations about how that kind of countercultural move is needed. And what individualism has cost. Yeah. Um, yeah. I also think a bunch of pastors are going to quit. I don't know if you're seeing this in your community, but. All over, all over. You know, um, Karen, it's funny because my wife's an ER nurse. So she's literally, she's literally on the front lines. And it's funny because I talk to her and I'll tell her, hey, so many pastors are talking about quitting. She's like, why? <laughs> <laughs> What are they dealing with? <laughs> but She's like, truth, oh, that sounds hard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> She's like, I had to interview eight, five people tonight. What What do you care about? You know? Uh, yeah. Oh, wow. Karen, I can't. I'm. I'm. Yeah. I think. I think what pains me is that. You know, I'll say like, I don't. Know, I, I I love this this stuff and desperately want to do it, and it's you know I'm just like, but I understand like. Yeah, I don't, I don't think, I think I would say like, this is another thing about a church planner. I feel like if you don't want to quit, like at least once a week, then you probably don't care about it enough. Yeah. I don't know if that's healthy yeah. or not, but that's. <laughs> no, that's how it feels. That's yeah. how it feels. And uh, honestly, like, I think that that's a gift. Like when I think about how the church is going to change, I don't think it's people who like, I I cared so much about church planting because holy things were unfolding in my presence, like Mm -hmm. all the time, constantly. And it was beautiful and powerful. I think the pastors that we're likely to lose in the midst of this are people who have heard a back and forth argument about whether or not to wear masks for eight months. And they are saying, you know, outside our door, people are going hungry. People are dying. People are sick. I got in this to bind up the brokenhearted, to support the weak, um, to help the afflicted. And I am having an eight month long argument with you about whether or not it is okay to breathe COVID on each other. Yeah, and I yeah. don't want to do this with my life anymore. Yeah. Um, and I get that. that. Is one, like, that's one good thing about being in a new church is I have not had to have those conversations. The, there is an incredible grace. The work is so hard. Um, but there's an incredible grace in being in a space where everybody knows what the stakes are because it's a new, it's a, we don't, we don't yeah. have to argue about like the memorial lamp that was given in <laughs> honor of so-and-so's yeah. great uncle. Cause it's like, we, we're here because of Jesus. We're here for life and death reasons. Um, mm-hmm. Let us not make 
golden calves to the past. Okay, I gotta ask, I gotta ask you one more question. I promise we'll take a break after this because I'm uh, I'm keeping you long here. Uh, this is a this is a question with I wrestle with all the time, and I'm someone who, like I said, I went to seminary. I have dreams of doing a demon, but I'm working on an MBA right now because I'm aware of like how the job prospects and the job paying prospects are slimmer by the hour. It seems like so. Like, what would you say? Like. I asked this to the president of my seminary in season two. Like, how do you balance like theological, the cost of theological education with also the reality of like the pennies that people are going to make? And I don't, I don't know, maybe the Presbyterian, the PCUSA, maybe all are, are rolling in it and it's not a concern, cause of concern, but I don't know. I mean, if, if our mainline denominations are rolling in it, we have to have a conversation about where that money came from, right? Fair um, enough, fair enough, yeah. I do think that the BCUSA is in many ways rolling in it. Um, I, I guess I need to so, become Presbyterian then. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's, uh, yeah. it's complicated money. But I mean, so the Presbyterian <laughs> Church, you can get theological education at a, at a pretty significantly reduced rate at most of our PCUSA seminaries. Um, mm -hmm. my, my seminary was fully covered, um, at Princeton. I know we offer significant aid at Pittsburgh, um, sometimes mm. including like cost of living aid, Wow. um, significant aid available at PCUSA seminary. So there is that now we have to talk about the opportunity cost of, uh, you know, doing yeah. something for three years of your life and what your earning potential is on the other side. Right. Right. I'm, I, I'm torn about this. So, I, I mean, I think we're probably about the same age. I'm a millennial. We've lived through some financial crises. Yeah. Here's another. Let's live through another. Sure, why not? Um, yeah. It right. is. I don't think the church gains credibility by drastically underpaying people because I think yeah. the people who are coming up now have seen what being underpaid looks like and do not respect yeah. it as a viable ethical posture. Yeah. Yeah. On the other hand, should ministry be a guild where everyone is comfortably middle class? Um, yeah, and, and really you know, upper middle show, class. Mm, in a lot of areas, for sure. Yeah. Um, I think in some of our bigger cities, that's less so. Um, yeah, but yeah, yeah. A, in a lot of areas, upper middle class. What does that mean? How do we and how do we deal with a professionalized clergy when, mm -hmm. like, the abundant community would say, like. We can do we can do church without professionalized leadership. I think there's a place for um, ordained clergy. I do. Um, I think ministry needs to be a whole lot more collaborative than it is. And I think we're fighting mm -hmm. a broader culture that says work seventy hours a week. Um, yeah. and, and in some cases, yeah. you have to work seventy hours a week to make it. Yeah. Um, so it's a, a bigger cultural challenge when we talk about volunteer labor creating churches. My short answer is way less programs, more human connection, um, yeah. life together. Yes. Ordained clergy, but we need to think about new models and, and I think we have the money to do it and we need to have hard conversations about the most faithful use of that money, knowing as we do mm. that much of it is stolen. Yeah. Well, this has been a great conversation. Let's take a break and we'll come back with some closing questions. Hi there. My name is Brian Davis, and I'm the host of the podcast Chasing Sunday, a show that talks to worship leaders and other church creatives about the pain, frustration, and joys they face as they work in the relentless world of producing art for churches 52 Sundays a year. It's a show about burning out and burning bright. Together, we talk about how we can find a healthier and more creative alternative to Chasing Sunday after Sunday. You can find us on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. We're back with Reverend Karen Rohr. I'm saying that right, right? Rohr? Yeah, Rohr like a lion. It's not phonetic okay. at all. I don't know. The Germans, I always get, what do you do? I always want to say people's names right because mine gets said wrong and misspelled a lot. So. Uh, you can take <laughs> I, I these do closing, appreciate that. You can take these closing questions as seriously or not as you'd like to. Uh, but if you're a Pope for a day, what do you want to do? What does that day look like for you? Oh man, so much fun. I start I start talking about climate change. I start trying to take down white supremacy. I get women ordained. I like 
<laughs> you know, we we start talking about LGBTQ inclusion. We're we're changing the church in a day. And the great thing about being yeah. for a day is you don't have to deal with any of the fallout. <laughs> You're like the first one who's <laughs> mentioned that. I love it. It's good just, you just tell them how it is and then you're like well i'll see you later say yeah uh yeah um what theologian or historical christian figure might you want to meet or bring back to life man so i'm really interested uh i'm interested in bayard rustin bayard rustin is the guy who orchestrated the march on washington uh in concert mm. with dr king He's the strategist, right, behind much of the civil rights movement, but he's a Quaker in the midst of folks who are from more mainline traditions. He's Mm -hmm. gay at a time that no one thinks that's okay, and he's not sorry about it. And he's working, like, alongside people who, who, you know, uh, theologically would not have accepted that. He's Mm -hmm. making, uh, he's, like, at the cutting edge of making the change that needs to be made. And somehow Mm -hmm. has the wisdom not to just yell at everyone. Don't you see that so much more change needs to be made, but like stay at that. I mean, he used to like, you know, the, the team would leave town and like, he had to like ride in the trunk of cars every now and again, because he was, he personally was at risk when others weren't. Um, which I mean, of course the civil rights folks were, all of them were at significant risk. I just think, yeah. he showed a lot of discernment about how to make the most of his life's work um, being who he was. And I, I would love to hear about how you think about that. Awesome. Uh, what do you think history will remember from this current time and place? <laughs> Profound uh, selfishness. And individualism oh. has caused us to form a sort of nationwide death cult, I think. Wow. Uh, man. That's a, yeah. <laughs> Let's leave it there. That's so, good. Sorry, I think that. Trying to keep this not, we don't want to go off the rails too negative here. Uh, let's sorry. let's spin it this way now. <laughs> Something hopeful. You hope for the future of Christianity. Oh, boy. <laughs> Uh, okay. Yes. Yeah, something hopeful for the future of Christianity. Um, I would like us to have a broader imagination and I would like it to be formed by the action of the Holy spirit in our lives rather than the muscle memory of white supremacy. Hmm. Good. Uh, I, I should say we're, we're being kind of morbid here because like we're in the end of November when COVID is going nuts in the country. So just some context for our listeners. <laughs> Thank well, you, Lauren, and I appreciate yeah. you balancing my natural tendencies here. Um, where can uh, where can people find out more about you? Oh man, um, so I'm not super active on social media. The first thing that I would recommend is uh, grab yourself a copy of Sustaining Grace. It's a short little book. It's not just me. It's uh, essays from 10 different folks from all different places in the Presbyterian Church ecosystem. It's not just a Presbyterian mm-hmm. book. Um, But I'm really proud of it. So check that out. Um, See who our conversation partners are in this work. Uh, Occasionally, I will blog for Pittsburgh Seminary. Um, I send out a monthly newsletter if you're interested in church planting stuff uh, through the seminary. So you can sign up for that. Honestly, like I'm a practicing pastor. So the places you could have found out more about me were like the weekly liturgies I wrote when I was pastoring. (laughs) But they have a very short shelf life, so yeah. they were part of worship many years ago, and and now they have gone. Yeah. Well, this has been great. Thank you so much for your time and uh, conversation. So uh, may God's peace be with you. Thank you so much, Lauren. It's been a delight. It's really good to know you. Thanks for joining us on the Future Christian Podcast. To learn more about Lauren or the podcast, visit future-christian.com. But hey, before you go, do us a favor, subscribe to the podcast and leave a review. It really helps us get the word out to more people. Thanks and go in peace.